We all need a break from the constant cycle to learn something new, to gain new perspectives. The Great Courses Plus streaming service is an excellent resource to expand our knowledge on a variety of subjects or pick up a new hobby. I've been enjoying The Great Courses Plus while researching this season of Flashback. Lectures like Play Ball, The Rise of Baseball as America's Pastime, History of the Supreme Court, and Battlefield Europe have helped me connect the dots on several stories from history. Right now, they're giving our listeners a special limited time offer, a free month of unlimited access to their entire library. Sign up now through our special URL. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash O-Z-Y. thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. My name is Chris Rawlins. Um, I'm a writer and filmmaker. So that's what I do. And um, really, my, most of my craft over the last 30, 40 years has been in filmmaking. Back in 1976, Rawlins took a job with a theater group in Leeds in northern England. I needed somewhere to live. Um, and this large... Um, Terraced, Victorian terraced house came possible for us to buy. Unfortunately, the house was so run down that it was under threat of demolition. And at that point, the guy selling it to us said, um, oh, they won't be able to knock this down. The inventor of the movie camera once lived here. No, not Thomas Edison. He lived in New Jersey. And we thought, ho, ho, is just, just a means for you to get your money. And he said, no, look, these, late, these rooms are deliberately long. You can project from the front door of the house to the back an uninterrupted beam. Rollins bought the house, and it turned out that the seller was right. A troubled French inventor named Augustin Le Prince had lived there back in the late 19th century. Chris Rollins, the filmmaker, had in fact just moved into the house where some of the first film images ever were shot. But Rollins soon discovered there was so much more to the story of Augustin Le Prince than just that. Back in 1890, Le Prince boarded a train to Paris. He planned next to sail to New York to share his new motion picture camera invention with the world. But Le Prince disappeared from that train and from the pages of history. His body was never found. Nobody ever discovered what happened, including his family, who threw quite a lot of resources at hiring private detectives to make it work. Nothing emerged. Welcome to Flashback, a podcast from Ozzy about some of history's most incredible unintended consequences. After he moved into Augustin Le Prince's old house, Chris Rollins spent the next decades of his life trying to figure out what happened to Le Prince and how close he was indeed to becoming the father of modern cinema. And what he learned is a remarkable story, one with consequences for everything from Thomas Edison to the founding of Hollywood in sunny California. It would be an arresting, even haunting series of images, even if it weren't so historic. Four adults parade around in circles in a sunlit garden, as if waiting for the horn to blow in some children's game. The clip lasts only two seconds, but there, in the suburbs of Leeds, England, in October 1888, you see the fruits of what is likely the first motion picture ever recorded. The cameraman behind that garden footage and the inventor of the technology that captured it was not Thomas Edison or even the Lumiere brothers. It was the man who had beaten them all to the punch, Augustin Le Prince. He set up his family on a Sunday and got them all out on the garden of Joseph Whitley's house to do a little dance. Whitley was the prince's brother-in-law. The scene was recorded at 12 frames per second, not quite the 16 frames per second that's required for the film to appear seamless to the human eye. So they're jumpy. They don't quite get to the persistence of vision. The following year, Le Prince shot another early film that still exists. Overlooking Liege Bridge, there is still an old warehouse building that looks down at the bridge from, from the right, which is the place he had his camera in the summer of 1889 to film traffic going over Leeds Bridge. And you can see people walking to and fro, and, well, only two, given there was only 30 frames. And, uh, and uh, I think it's uh, a wagon being taken across by horses. It's kind of incredible watching something that was filmed more than 130 years ago. 
And for those who want to watch the clips, I will include links to them in my lecture notes this week at the Flashback homepage on Aussie.com. Augustin Le Prince was born in France in 1841. He was tall, dark, and handsome. Um, his father was a, an army officer and friends with Daguerre. That's Louis Daguerre, the father of photography. As a young man, Le Prince studied painting and chemistry in Paris, where he also met a woman from Northern England named Lizzie Whitley. The two married, and Le Prince took a job as the manager of a cyclorama. Cyclorama was a sort of huge circus tent uh, on the perimeter of which, if you like, was painted a battle, say, the Battle of Atlanta or the Battle of Gettysburg. The cyclorama was kind of the IMAX of the 19th century. There was a big platform that viewers would stand on in the center so that they could look at the panoramic image around them. So if there were soldiers struggling in a particular part of the battle or a boat was needed, half of that boat would be real in three dimensions and the other half would be painted, which made it seem as if that too was of three dimensions and that the transition from three-dimensionality to two-dimensionality was as imperceptible as possible. It was a surreal experience at the time, but Le Prince thought he could do even better. His dream was to make a version of a, a moving cyclorama in colour, he, he put it. That is, to bring it to life, to make it move. All the potential of this trick of the eye that made it seem as if it was real, he wanted to take a step further into motion and, and into animation. In the 1880s, Le Prince began to tinker with photography and eventually motion pictures, but he was far from the only inventor in the world trying to harness the power of the moving image. There was a race going on, and somewhat of a ruthless one. Well, inventions and patents were a big deal in those days. Secrecy was encouraged. It was often felt that there might be spies there to get their secrets. Le Prince took incredible precautions at his workshop in Leeds to keep his innovative work confidential. The anxious, chain-smoking inventor had shutters installed on the windows, extra bolts placed on the doors. He was paranoid, if you like, that somebody would get hold of his invention and beat him to it. There was one rival inventor in particular that Le Prince was eager to keep his progress a secret from, Thomas Edison. So Edison really ran a conglomerate in Orange, New Jersey, uh, it was an invention factory. This is Peter DeCherney, a professor of cinema and media studies at the University of Pennsylvania and author of Hollywood's Copyright Wars. He had people in some rooms working on new chemicals and other rooms working on new technologies. He ran multiple media businesses. Yeah, I mean, you have to go to kind of like a Microsoft or Google or Amazon today to think about a company that's working in so many different fields at the same time. Edison also had great information. He knew most of what his competitors like Le Prince were doing, and often visited other countries to gather intelligence himself. But when Edison and his team first got truly interested in filmmaking in the late 1880s, they were going in a very different direction from Le Prince. Edison actually was working on something called a kinetograph and kinetoscope, um, and it was almost a kind of a peep show viewer. In October 1888, Edison filed a preliminary claim with the U.S. Patent Office, announcing his plans to create a device that would do, quote, for the eye, what the phonograph does for the ear. He thought people would wanted to watch movies uh, one at a time um, on, on a device just of watching them alone. And he was actually kind of caught off guard when uh, movie theaters uh, and, and projection ended up being more popular. Meanwhile, Augustin Le Prince was working on his own motion picture projection. At the same time Edison was filing his rather vague claims with the U.S. Patent Office, Le Prince had built what he called a receiver, a single-lens motion picture camera that weighed about 40 pounds in which a light-sensitized strip of paper was advanced between a lens and a shutter by cranking a handle along one side. It was the camera he would use to take the amazing footage in Leeds. And by 1890, Le Prince was preparing to share his invention with the world, something he planned to do in style in New York. Chris Rollins. He and his family had rented the Jumel Mansion. Um, and the Jumel Mansion was a, a beautiful colonial style house. Uh, George Washington is alleged to have lived there, etc., etc. So it has a kind of deep connection with American history. 
and to ensure his own place in history against competitors like Edison, Le Prince planned to patent his invention during his time in America. He just had a few more items to take care of in Leeds and at home in France first. And he was due to get back to New York from Leeds in October 1890. And they were then going to do the projection and hooray, hurrah, the movies would have been born and the prince would have got the credit and the rest would have been history. Except Le Prince never made it to New York or into his rightful place in history. But what happened next is a mystery worthy of the film industry that Le Prince almost helped create. That's next on Flashback. Do you have an interesting tale about unintended consequences from history or your own life? Please share it with us by emailing flashback at ozzy.com. That's flashback at ozy.com. We all need a break from the constant cycle to learn something new, to gain new perspectives. The Great Courses Plus streaming service is an excellent resource to expand our knowledge on a variety of subjects or pick up a new hobby. I've been enjoying The Great Courses Plus while researching this season of Flashback. Lectures like Play Ball, The Rise of Baseball as America's Pastime, History of the Supreme Court, and Battlefield Europe have helped me connect the dots on several stories from history. Right now, they're giving our listeners a special limited time offer, a free month of unlimited access to their entire library. Sign up now through our special URL. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Aussie. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash O-Z-Y. Thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Ozzy. In the fall of 1890, Augustin Le Prince was on the verge of making history in New York. But first he had some family business to attend to in France. He went to Dijon, where his brother was living. Um, we're never quite sure why, but the various issues of money that emerged in my research his debts, his anxiety about money, the fact that his mother had recently died and the will hadn't yet been settled. Le Prince was likely counting on some family money to help keep his own struggling operation afloat, but he did not get the relief he sought. Le Prince boarded the 242 afternoon train for Paris on Tuesday, September 16th, 1890. His brother saw him off at the platform. Inside his luggage, he carried his original films and patent plans. Waiting to meet Le Prince in Paris were Richard Wilson, a good friend, along with his family. The Wilson family waiting for Le Prince to arrive off that train in, on September the 16th, 1890, waited and waited, and he simply did not show. Um, and he was never seen again. Both French and English detectives conducted an extensive search and investigation but no clues, no luggage, and no Le Prince were ever found. Investigators speculated he might have been mugged and killed in Paris after leaving the station, something not uncommon among lone travelers of the day. Others saw a more far-reaching conspiracy. So what happened? Well, although the smoking gun is lovely, when I sold this book to various publishers in 18, 1988, it was a smoking gun, of course, that got them. And if I could pin something on Edison, boy, would that be a big one. Edison certainly wound up being the primary beneficiary of Le Prince's disappearance. The American inventor filed his first patent for a working movie camera and viewer called the Kinetoscope about a year after Le Prince vanished. But motion pictures did not move in the direction that Edison had expected. They moved the way Le Prince had anticipated, toward the projection of images. So Edison had to pivot. Peter de Cherny again. And actually, he quickly abandoned the, d the device, the kinetoscope and kinetograph that he developed, and he quickly bought someone else's uh, device, two, two recent engineering graduate students, and just patented it with his own, or, or re renamed it with his own, uh, his own name, called it Edison's Vitascope. The Vitascope was an early film projector, and it helped put Edison on the motion picture map. Still, despite his efforts to acquire and adopt others' inventions and claim them as his own, Edison had little success at first in his efforts at colonizing the motion picture space, the way he had other areas of innovation. So he had three patents on films, and ultimately he claimed in some lawsuits that all film equipment and films themselves owed something to his genius. But eventually, uh, every film, every, all of his three patents were overturned in court. Uh, one judge went so far as to say that Edison was not a pioneer in any sense of the term. 
Edison might not have been a true film pioneer, but the so-called Wizard of Menlo Park was a shrewd businessman. And as silent films grew more popular in America, he took steps to control their production process, from creation to distribution to projection. In 1908, he assembled the heads of his rival film companies and proposed they join forces in a venture called the Motion Picture Patents Company, or MPPC. The MPPC would hold collectively owned film production patents and would issue licenses to any film producer, exhibitor, or distributor who tried to get in on the young motion pictures business. One of the reasons he did this was that he took his small patents and pooled them with other companies that had patents. They really did succeed briefly in controlling the whole industry. It was a bid for control, however, that would wind up backfiring and catapulting the motion picture business in a very different direction. West. We've forgotten this now, but Fort Lee, New Jersey was actually the first U.S. movie capital. Uh, it was right across the, the bridge from New York, and it was a great place to shoot westerns, which were, which were popular. Why New Jersey? That's where Thomas Edison was based. Towering over a 35-acre state park is a tribute to New Jersey's legendary inventor, Thomas Edison. You can still visit the Thomas Edison Center at Menlo Park and see the massive light bulb perched high above the landscape. The Edison pioneers, which included those who work with the inventor, were determined to honor his legacy and his associates with this 131-foot tower. Today, Edison is remembered primarily for his creations, but he knew that invention involved much more than creativity. Chris Rollins. Now, for many years, Edison himself had known the importance of, of getting the patent on something. He'd suffered at the hands of people who tried to break his patents and infringe his patents um, many times. It was part of the cost of doing business. He is alleged to have said, I put this quote, everyone steals in industry and com commerce. I've stolen a lot myself. The thing is to know how to steal. And Edison did. Now, knowing how to steal involves having an army of lawyers who are going to pursue everything down to the last iota um, to try and prove their point. Peter DeCherney. He had a team of lawyers uh, who um, were constantly fighting battles for him and were part of his business strategy. He often could just outspend the competition in court. And for a while, the strategy worked. He really thought he was going to be able to keep things static and not uh, and, and triumph over the competition. Um, and he'd done that in other industries. He had done that um, in the phonograph industry, for example. As a result, competing against Edison in the film business as a so-called independent in the early years of the 20th century was quite an undertaking. If you weren't part of the, the motion picture patent company, or the trust as it was called, you had to go to Europe to buy film stock, and you had to make the films yourself on equipment that was made by someone who wasn't part of the, the trust, also probably from Europe, and then you had to find theaters who were willing to be independent theaters and be locked out of uh, the trust. It didn't take long, however, for the independent film producers to strike back. So the independents incorporated just a few days after the Motion Picture Patents Company. They didn't want to be part of this conglomerate network that exacted a huge fee and basically told them how to make films and, and how the system was going to work. But Edison's trust started to zealously enforce their patent portfolio in the years ahead. They lodged nearly 300 legal complaints against Universal Pictures alone. The independents fought Edison's trust in court, and more importantly, they did something else, innovate. But the independents realized that there was a rising middle-class audience for films, and they wanted to see theatrical adaptations, not adaptations of novels, feature films were more likely to be able to adapt these works. Uh, and also, they started to take theater stars and, and feature them in movies. The independent filmmakers also began to look for new, less hostile surroundings, a safe distance from Edison's base on the East Coast. The independents slowly moved westward and eventually ended up in Los Angeles. It was a natural fit. LA was appealing for a bunch of reasons. It was a non-union town, so labor was cheaper. And it certainly didn't hurt that federal courts there were less inclined to enforce patent rights. But mostly, they ended up in Los Angeles because there's varied terrain in, um, in a very short distance. You could be in the mountains one day, in the desert the next day, on the beach another day, uh, and you could shoot all year, all year long with good sun conditions. 
By the way, sunshine was huge for early movies. Before the era of powerful Klieg lights and more sophisticated film, it was hard to get enough light to shoot indoors. Edison Studio actually famously had a roof that opened and then could turn the entire building turn 360 degrees to catch the sun. But it was still in New Jersey, and the future of film was elsewhere. Edison's henchmen pursued the independence in California for a while, but ultimately had to stop. In 1915, the Motion Picture Patents Company was declared an illegal monopoly by the Supreme Court, but actually that didn't matter that much. If by, even a few years earlier, by 1913 or so, the Motion Picture Patents Company was already kind of losing out because they refused to innovate. In other words, Edison's repressive legal regime wound up stifling more than just the competition. Ultimately, that system backfired for Edison. Trust members reaped so many benefits from the status quo, they had little incentive to innovate in what was a rapidly evolving industry. And so ultimately, they were surpassed by the independents. It's a lesson that still resonates today. By creating this, um, this oligopoly, by really controlling the industry, there was no incentive to change and, and to innovate and to move with the audience. And so they fought resistance, and they were very quickly supplanted by other companies who were trying to do something new and who were paying more attention to what audiences wanted. And as often is the case in history, yesterday's rebels and innovators become today's industry giants. In a way, what's interesting is the independents, um, who were the, the underdogs, uh, ended up creating Paramount and Fox and Universal and all the studios who are still uh, really central to, um, to, to the media industry. Indeed, by 2012, only seven film producers accounted for almost 90% of the worldwide market share. But what became of the inventor whose mysterious disappearance helped start this chain reaction of events in the first place? Augustin Le Prince's sudden disappearance in 1890 devastated his family. His wife, Lizzie, um, could not accept that he might have vanished for any reason other than foul play. And she set about trying to prove her late husband's role in early cinema. Lizzie Le Prince went on for the rest of her life trying to get the story told and trying to publish missing chapters in the story of, in the history of moving pictures. It was a story of intrigue and suspicion, but no apparent foul play. But of course, nothing emerged that could conclu conclusively say that Edison had any part in Le Prince's disappearance. This shouldn't be said to whitewash um, the principles or the lack of Edison brought to pursuing his patents, but to implement in him in disappearance and murder is the wrong trick here, I think. In Rollins's view, there was a more simple explanation, suicide. There's huge shame attached, huge um, blame, if you like, or guilt is experienced in those years by financial instability, by doing the wrong thing with money. And he would have felt that that brought shame to his family. More recently, a key new piece of evidence surfaced to support this theory. I was very interested a few years back to hear that a photograph of a man taken from the River Seine in October 1890 showed an image that, to my mind, was indisputably Le Prince. If you put it in Photoshop and shift the angle of the corpse shown from a high, acute angle and put, put it into light, looking at it directly, if you like, <clears throat> you can't doubt that it's Le Prince. But the photograph raised its own questions. And it's been worked out that the clothes that the corpse has on are a pauper's clothes. They're not the clothes of a rich man or an enlightened bourgeois person. So the question is why? And the person looking into this suggested that he might have sold his clothes and simply got those clothes in substitution because he was simply that skint. So why would someone like Le Prince, on the verge of a history-making demonstration, sell his clothes and eventually kill himself? My view is that he failed. He was aware of his failure. To have everybody dependent on his success, but not to be able to be absolutely straight about what he had or hadn't achieved was too much for him. Augustin Le Prince was on the right track with his motion picture camera, and he was ahead of the competition, even Thomas Edison. He was on the verge of history, and he might well have made history had he not run out of money, but he fell short. I don't think Le Prince was quite there. I think the story is incredible. 
I think our culture is in love with failure the also ran, because we all feel we're a little bit also rans. And when there's a mystery like this attached to it, um, then we want to latch on to it. We want to tell it to the world. Including through the medium Le Prince almost pioneered, film. And it's, I think, lit up the imaginations of subsequent would-be filmmakers, including myself, for the many decades since. I still get calls from people who stumble on the story and think, this would make such a good film script. But, says Rollins, Le Prince's story does not quite have the requisite Hollywood ending. The fact that this makes such a brilliant Hollywood-style story um, is irresistible to, to many people who have tried to bring it into reality. But it doesn't quite have the take that would turn it into a must-have as far as the movie producers are concerned, I don't think. So what did we learn today in this final episode of season one of Flashback? First, Thomas Edison's true genius might have been his ability to recognize and capitalize on the good ideas of others. Two, invention is 99% perspiration and 1% a fleet of good lawyers. And third, although the weather might not be as nice as in Southern California, if you want to visit the true birth of filmmaking, you should pack your bags for New Jersey, or better yet, Leeds. Finally, this season of Flashback on Unintended Consequences has shown us the many ways that life and history turn out differently than we might intend or expect. The past can teach us a lot. It tells us that things change, sometimes on a dime, and sometimes on a time scale of centuries. The past teaches us that so much of the world around us is contingent, that things don't have to be the way that they are now, and almost weren't. There is something both unnerving about that fact and empowering. Used wisely, the past is a key to help us unlock the potential of the future. And the more we learn about history in the past, the more we can learn to make better decisions about the things we can control and live with the things we know we can't. A big thanks for listening this season, and please stay tuned to this feed for some fun bonus episodes and for season two. Next season, we will be exploring some of what we call history's legends of the fail, Tales of epic failures, disasters, and miscalculations that we can still all learn from today. Flashback is written and hosted by me, Sean Braswell, senior writer and executive producer at Ozzy. It was produced by Robert Kulos, Tracy Moran, Yori Dogizuwa, and Shannon Williamson. Chris Hoff engineered our show. Special thanks to the crew at iHeartRadio Podcast Networks, especially Sophie Lichterman and Jack O'Brien. We'd also like to thank the wider team who helped make this entire season possible. At iHeartRadio Podcast Networks, we'd like to thank Connell Byrne, Will Pearson, Nathan Otoski, Mike Cohane, Ray Harkins, Sam Benefeld, Harper Wayne, and Christy Waters. And at Aussie, we'd like to thank Carlos Watson, Samir Rao, Noel Kehoe, James Watkins, Ned Collin, Alex Lau, and Daniel Malloy. Make sure to subscribe to Flashback on the iHeartRadio app or listen wherever you get your podcasts. Finally, today's lecture note. Thomas Edison was good friends with another titan of American industry we covered earlier this season on Flashback, Henry Ford. Starting in 1914, the two aging industrialists took a series of road trips across the country together. Apparently, neither man could even take a holiday without converting it into some form of publicity stunt. The press followed the two pioneers, who were nicknamed the Vagabonds, from stop to stop, and documented them roughing it in the outdoors by chopping wood themselves and more. It was kind of like a cross between a celebrity Instagram feed and one of Vladimir Putin's bare-chested horseback riding photo ops. To dive deeper, head to ozzy.com slash flashback. That's ozy.com slash flashback. There you can find my other lecture notes from today's episode, featuring extended interviews, links to further reading, and more information on unintended consequences and mysterious disappearances, as well as links to other hidden stories from history, uncovered by me and other reporters at Ozzy. Thanks for listening. We all need a break from the constant cycle to learn something new, to gain new perspectives. 
The Great Courses Plus streaming service is an excellent resource to expand our knowledge on a variety of subjects or pick up a new hobby. I've been enjoying The Great Courses Plus while researching this season of Flashback. Lectures like Play Ball, The Rise of Baseball as America's Pastime, History of the Supreme Court, and Battlefield Europe have helped me connect the dots on several stories from history. Right now, they're giving our listeners a special limited time offer, a free month of unlimited access to their entire library. Sign up now through our special URL. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Ozzy. That's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash O-Z-Y. Thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Ozzy.